question I want to pose is, are we here by chance? When we look into our Bibles, in the very first chapter and the very first verse in Genesis, we read, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then the following verses give us more detail about that creation, right up to the creation of human beings. But many people today would say we've learned so much about the world we live in and about the universe in general, we no longer have to attribute that to God or a God. We can work it all out step by step and it all arose as a result of natural causes randomly occurring over long periods of time. Some scientists, and of course that well-known atheist Richard Dawkins, emphatically assert that this is the way the universe, the earth, and life in general evolved. So the question before us becomes, did God create us, or are we just simply a lucky accident? Well, of course, even with all our knowledge today, we don't know everything by a long shot. Our knowledge is incomplete, and many of the things that we think we understand in science are probably wrong. And because we don't have sufficient data, we can't be sure. But working on what we do have and what we do understand, what are the basic steps needed to produce the universe, the world, and life as we know it, and as we see it here today. What's the recipe or the prescription for a universe? The conditions that must be in place, without any one of which we probably would not be here. We must start with a singularity, and no one knows quite what that is. We can't get one in a laboratory and pull it apart. We can't manufacture one. But according to the current theory, a singularity is an infinitely small object having no dimensions, but is infinitely dense. And it's a place where there is no time, no space, and the laws of physics as we understand them simply don't apply. So it's a very peculiar object, but that's what we believe the universe started with. And then next, there had to be a creation event, what science refers to as the Big Bang. For no reason known to science, that singularity I mentioned rapidly expanded very rapidly in the first second uh, for a time it expanded faster than the speed of light. It was intensely hot, trillions of degrees hot and gradually it slowed down and cooled down but the expansion of course continued. So we don't know how the singularity came to be we don't really know what it was, and we don't know why it exploded or expanded into a, a universe in creation. But we do know that the rate of expansion and the rate of cooling had to be just at the right speed. If it was too fast or too slow, we wouldn't have ended up perhaps with a universe at all, or at least the universe we have, 13.8 billion years later. And then the four natural forces would have been created at the time this all occurred. One we're all familiar with, the force of gravity, would have made its first appearance. And the others are the electromagnetic force that governs electricity and magnetism and light, the strong nuclear force that binds the nucleus of an atom together, 
and the weak nuclear force that relates to uh, electrons within the atom. All of these had to come into play and all of them had to be at precisely the right strength and operating within the right parameters. Otherwise, matter wouldn't have formed and we simply wouldn't have been here. As things cooled, and Einstein's famous formula, E equals mc squared, came into play, all this energy of expansion and heat that was now in the universe commenced to be converted, at least in part, into protons, neutrons and electrons, matter as we understand it, as well as antimatter being their opposite counterparts. So the universe now is a lot of heat, a lot of energy, and matter is making its first appearance. There had to be more matter than antimatter because when antimatter meets matter, the two annihilate and all that's left is back to energy again. So as we live in a today in a, in a universe that has matter and very little, if any, antimatter, there had to be a surplus of matter over antimatter at the start, and we don't know why or how that came to be. And then two thirds of the age of the universe elapses, nine billion years. And nine billion years after the Big Bang, not for the first time because this happened many times, a huge cloud or nebula of gas and dust for some reason began to spin and contract as it span. Probably it collided with another similar cloud or an exploding star disturbed it and as it travelled through space at high speed, spinning all the way, part of the content of the cloud contracted into a clump in the middle that became denser and denser as it got smaller and smaller, and eventually so dense, nuclear reactions started to take place in the hydrogen of which it was largely composed, and a star was born. Smaller clumps orbited from the same cloud, orbited the, the new star, but they were not sufficiently big enough to light any nuclear fires, and as a consequence, remained just balls of gas and dust contracting and eventually assuming a spherical shape. These were the planets and the moons and all the other contents of the solar system. Most stars, or at least half the stars and probably the majority of stars in the universe as we know it are double or multiple stars. We were fortunate that with the choice of our sun it was a solitary one because had we been a planet orbiting two or more stars and being subjected at varying intervals to multiple starlight and then perhaps only one or none, the climate change would have been horrific. So we were lucky to end up with just the sun. But the sun had to be just more than a solitary star. It had to be long lived Many stars only last uh, a few million years and that, as we know, isn't long enough to produce the world we live in today. And then again, not only has the star got to be long lived, it's got to be very, very constant in its light and heat output. Otherwise, again, we wouldn't be able to withstand the variations in climate. And then, of course, there have to be planets around the star, and as our recent uh, exploration of stars near the Earth 
reveals, it seems most stars have a family of planets. But not many have a planet that duplicates in any sense the planet we live on. There are always some variations that would make their planets dissimilar from ours. And this planet, the Earth, has to be at just the right distance from the Sun to be neither too hot nor too cold, what's often referred to as the Goldilocks zone. We look at our own solar system and we see Venus, which is 70% of the distance we are from the Sun, and yet it's far too hot with a surface temperature of about 450 degrees. We look at the other planet that's closest to us, beyond us, Mars, and it's about one and a half times further out than we are, and it's far too cold. Now, I've just run through some 29 in all, 29 conditions that have to be gone through to reach where we are at the present stage. If you remove any one of those items or assign to them different values or strengths or frequencies, as the case may be, you end up with a universe and an Earth, if in fact they exist at all, vastly different and probably not habitable as far as the Earth is concerned for life. We know we have something like 200 billion stars, and probably each of them has planets of one sort or another, in our Milky Way galaxy. But as far as we know, there is no other just like Earth, and probably in view of the large number of conditions that have to be present, none other that can bring together all of those 29, plus any others we haven't yet thought of or become aware of, all of those conditions together to constitute what we know as life on this planet today. So getting back to our start, our question, are we here by chance? What's the likelihood of all these factors coming together, as Richard Dawkins would argue, by natural events, natural processes occurring at random. If we were to give each of these uh, conditions a 10% chance of being present, arbitrary but not unreasonable, some are, some are like, more likely than 10%, some are less likely, but if we assigned that kind of chance to each single one of them, we'd end up, when we put it all together to see how, how our chances would be for all 29, with one followed by 29 zeros, an enormous number exceeding by far the estimated number of stars in the entire universe. We don't know what the individual chances are of most of these factors occurring, but what we do know is the chances are obviously going to be extremely remote uh, if we have to rely upon natural processes. So I think it's almost inevitable. The answer to our question is, are we here by chance? No, we are not. And if we're not here by chance, it seems to me we must be here as the product of intentional design. And if so, there has to be a designer. And this surely is very strong external evidence for the presence of God as that designer and creator. Of course, 
we don't need this many of us to prove that God is there. We know God exists because we talk to him. We know that he acts within our lives. We pray to him. He answers our prayers. The presence of his Holy Spirit in our daily lives is a given and without which our lives in any event would be vastly different. But here, in the processes I've described and the conclusion I've reached, is, if you like, external evidence unsupported by any theological basis, but external evidence based purely on our observation of the physical world. I think we can again return to the Bible, this time the Psalms, Psalm 19, and readily affirm as true the first verse of that Psalm. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. <laughs> 